Welcome to the ninth video in my series of You Can Play This. This video features two important aspects of playing the lute. The first is concerned with right hand articulation and for this I'll be expanding more in my lute web top tips in the second half of this video. The second is ornamentation. For the lute, this subject is a bit of a minefield of unknowns and conflicting evidence as well as strong opinions. Given the time frame I have here, which is not long, I will only be presenting a brief outline. There is so much to say and I'm sure I'll be revisiting both these aspects in the future. The piece I'm highlighting as an example of both these issues is an Almain for John Sturt from the ML Lute Book. Was it written for John Sturt or written by John Sturt? I'm afraid I couldn't tell you. This manuscript is full of unknowns. It seems it has various descriptions, the title, The Margaret Lute Book, being one, and to confuse things further, it is also categorised as being attributed to John Sturt too. Just to say, the manuscript is not to be mistaken for the Margaret Board Lute Book, dated 1620. As you can see, things are already becoming a little bit murky. There are six pieces attributed to John Sturt in the collection of 89 lute solos and it's thought that he was one of two scribes that compiled this book as the handwriting changes after folio 28. The initials ML are written on the cover and turning the page over a poem can be found which has the opening words Margarita Margarita suggesting perhaps this book belongs to a woman. It has to be said though Nobody is really sure who this book belongs to. The manuscript contains some wonderful lute solo music from Dowland's Lacrimae to Salinger's Round. It's an astonishing collection. Matthew Spring suggests that this repertoire is specifically connected to the court and it's thought that perhaps John Sturt, who was indeed a court lutenist between 1610 and 1612, was compiling it for private use. The choice of pieces are heavily influenced by the French style, which also suggests Sturt was perhaps a travelling musician. This Almain caught my eye as it's awash with ornamentation signs and right-hand technical markings, a real treasure trove for us lute players. Indeed, the style of the piece feels very French, with the use of joyful dotted rhythms giving it that Gallic swagger. It has so many ornamentation markings that they almost occur on every other note. It's astonishing and very revealing. Divided into four part sections, the ornamentation is concentrated in the first half of the piece, then is diluted somewhat in the division sections. There are just two types of symbol used to indicate an ornament, a cross or X, and a symbol we would now call a hashtag. What do they mean? Well, good question. I find this a really difficult one as many sources say conflicting things, even the academics have differing views. I'm with Christopher Wilson's approach in the introduction to his seminar on Dowland's Graces presented to the Lute Society here in the UK back in 2015. So what ornaments did they play and when? This is not an easy question to answer. A measure of the difficulty of the subject is that scholars have come to opposite conclusions about the meaning of even the most commonest signs. Quite often, lute music is devoid of ornamentation signs as the meaning and execution is so personal and complex. Mersenne, in his Harmony Universelle, 1636, gives the impression that ornaments mean whatever I want them to mean. My opinion is that much pondering is required. As a player, you must always take into consideration the surrounding evidence, otherwise one is in danger of going off-piste. I shall talk a little bit more about my use of ornamentation in my top loop web tips, but just to say, in this particular Almain, I found there were too many indications for ornamentation, and for me personally, it felt crowded and chaotic. Perhaps I'm not entering into the Gallic spirit enough. 
So some I have kept, one or two I've added, quite a few I've dropped. All the ornaments I play are annotated in my downloadable copy. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. So here it is. And don't forget to check out my top loop web tips after this. tips from Loop Web. For bars 17 to 28, I've stuck like glue to the original right hand markings. You will notice that the emphasis is on I and M and not so much on P and I. material is composed, the use of this articulation makes perfect sense. Here we have a very clear separation of the treble and bass. To try to play with P and I is really quite cumbersome. Other pieces in this manuscript require a 10 course lute. The compositions are less polyphonic, thus indicating a shift in technique and style. Hence the interweaving of P and I with the use of I and M articulation. I use the hashtag type symbol to represent a trill using the upper or lower auxiliary, but this symbol could represent any grace. This ornament is also known to be called a shake. It was between 1620 and 1630 that this symbol was most commonly annotated. There are multiple ways in which it could be executed, leading to more decisions. I can only really give you my personal thoughts by playing. <laughs> started to be documented in books from around 1590 and this was called a fall. To put it in its basic terms, a hammer on or a pull off. By 1610 you could have a myriad of variants. A forefall, a shaked forefall, a double forefall, a backfall, a double backfall. The mind boggles. I often think of one little bit of advice by Jean-Baptiste Obersado from The Necessary Observations Belonging to the Lute. You should have some rules for the sweet relishes and shakes if they could be expressed here as they are on the lute. But seeing they cannot by speech or writing be expressed, thou wert best to imitate some cunning player. that score it has all the ornament markings I've played for this video 
plus clear indications for the right hand, which follow the original score. The link is below. Don't forget, if you are a guitarist and you've enjoyed watching this video, you too can play this piece remembering to tune the third string down a semitone to an F sharp. Put a capo on the third fret and you'll be at the same pitch as this version. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. Happy lute playing. Thank you.